I woke up this morning and there was a notification in Chrome or Android or whatever talking about this thing, which I had no idea existed. It's an officially licensed mini PlayStation 4 controller uh, made by Hori, who's actually one of the few third-party manufacturers of PlayStation 4 controllers. It's for kids because they have smaller hands. But you know what I'm thinking, small hands equals small circuit board. So, <laughs> yeah, I read that at like noon, and then the closest place that had one in Madison was <clears throat> Walmart. So after waiting an ungodly amount of time for a key, I have it. So how small is it really? much smaller. Actually, yeah, it's not that much smaller at all. But the thing that I was interested in is, yes, a smaller, simpler circuit board. And Hori, at least in the past, I know they make controllers that just have standard PCBs, not silkscreen circuitry like what you find in PlayStation 1 through 4, which means you can mod it. And that's what I'm interested in for single-handed use. I've never been able to make a PlayStation 4 single-handed controller. Well, I made a few prototypes, but I need something that's more consistent, so that's why I bought this. All right, I removed the screws. Let's see what's inside. Well, that comes apart really simply. Oh, yes, yes. All right, this is like modding catnip. Look at this stuff. Everything is labeled, and there's test points for all the buttons. Test point for square, X, circle, triangle. Then your D-pad test points over here. Yes, this is what we want to see. There's another Hori PlayStation 4 controller, which looks exactly like this. And uh, I've bought a couple of these over the years to look into modifying. And uh, it's also straightforward with a lot of test points, but there's also some weirdness. Like it's PlayStation 3 compatible, which means these buttons are analog compatible, which was a PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3 thing, whereas in PlayStation 4, only these buttons are analog. Compared to the PlayStation 4 controller, which doesn't have any visible test pads, it also has a dark blue soak screen, which makes it hard to read things. Oh, by the way, people hate dark blue or black soak screens because it makes it really hard to figure out where the traces are. But yeah, look at this. You just gotta put, up, put down some solder on these test points and you're good to go. Actually, no scope required. No scope, it's like Call of Duty. Let's put one lead on ground and then touch the other side of these switches. Oh yeah, look at, listen to that. Standard signal to ground pull low circuitry, yes. The only place it's not gonna happen is like an R2, I'm guessing. Look, it's labeled, can you see that? I'm in love with the shape of it. Look at that, ADC. I'm guessing that the ADCs on the left and right triggers are tied together. Yep, they are. So, microcontrollers, you know, they have ADCs analog to digital converters, but there's usually actually only one ADC because it takes up a lot of space in the die. So they multiplex it. So you might have multiple pins that can take an ADC reading, but only one of those pins is actually sent to the multiplexer at a time, so they have to take turns. So in this case, it's gonna take the ADC reading from one of the you know, from L2 and then take it from R2. Basically, it'll take turns. So this solder, I bought this at a game convention a while back. It's actually from the old Atari Corporation, Surplus. This guy had all these rolls of solder like that. He's like, yeah, the Surplus after Atari closed. And I'm like, how much? He's like, five bucks a piece. And then I said, I'll take all of them, because <laughs> that's a killer deal for a pound of solder. There you go. When I push the button, the L2 button, see that rise there? So it has a baseline voltage of, I don't know, about 2.5 volts. Then it rises up to about 3 when you push it. There's some short pushes. Uh, yeah, so the that's a baseline push, and then the more you push it, the, I mean, the harder you push it, the higher it goes. So here's how PlayStation does their analog shoulder buttons. You have a carbon silicon pad here, which presses down 
on a resistive strip right there on the PCB. So if, I don't know if you can see it here, but that pad is actually uh, convex. It's like a little bit of a dome. So basically, the harder you push that little dome down, the more of its surface area goes across the resistive contact and the less resistance there is giving an analog value. Uh, yeah, but see the difference? You've got the resistive strip there and then just a standard switch there. I'm going to bump my iron up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. America degrees! Yeehaw! Now I'm going to put some lead solder on this. Now I'm going to pull and just heat this up. And she'll be out like Flynn. I still got a little bit of the scar from last time. Well, it's not a scar because it'll heal completely. No problems. Okay, so see this? This is everything you need, really. So think about it like this. You could make like a controller like that. Look at that. See, it would fit in kind of like a pistol grip kind of shape, right? So you could have your analog here, your triggers here, other things there. And that's what's really cool about the circuit board. It's so small. Now, okay, it has negatives, of course. There's no rumble feature, which probably because rumble is another license. Remember the immersion rumble lawsuits from back in the day? Uh, also, it doesn't have a headphone jack, but you can use Bluetooth and other things with PlayStation, so it's not like you need the controller to do voice chat. After I moved, I wasn't sure where my angle measuring device went, so I'm gonna have to use this speed square. Okay, so this is my hand. I'm gonna put it in front of the speed square. So what I wanna do is figure out the angle of the PCB relative to my wrist. It looks like, yeah, yeah it's more than I would think. Maybe about 60 degrees, which is actually 30 degrees because it's 90 minus 60. Now a flatbed scanner might seem like an obsolete device, but it's actually super useful for what I'm about to do. So I'm gonna take the PCB and put it into the scanner so I can get a scan of it. Now the thing that's nice about the scanner or anything really that involves paper sizes is it will always give you an accurate representation of the size. So the image that this scans in will be actual size. Something about scanners. So the scanner mechanically moves this way to scan something, but the image sensor isn't actually this wide. The image sensor is actually quite small and there's a lens that takes this light and bends it down into the scanner. So the reason I bring that up is because that means things you scan will be more accurate in this axis than in this axis, because this axis is optically compressed. So for something like this, I oriented it the way I did, so we have the most accurate resolution in this direction for you know the bulk of the object, and the slightly distorted horizontal resolution affects a small amount of the part. Here is the scanned image in Photoshop. Going to crop, rotate counterclockwise. I tried to make it as straight as I could, but I'm sure it's not perfect. So I'm going to put a guideline there. I'm going to go down here and go to rotate. Put the rotation point there so it matches up the guideline and the PCB and just make sure that it's as straight as possible. That looks pretty good. It was probably only about half a degree off. I'm going to crop this. As you can see, it forms a square, even if there's a bunch of 45 degree cuts on it. Cool. Now, IRL, not in the screen cap. I'm going to use my dial caliper to measure what the total length is of this PCB getting 4.533 4.533 okay image size go into inches holy crap okay I didn't expect that 4.533 wow that is 
bang on. That's never happened before. Okay, I'm just going to double check the vertical. Uh, 1.33. 0.34. You know what? The other one was so close, I'm not even going to bother changing this one. So, yeah, I mean, a scanner with a flat object can be very accurate. I could just save this and take it into Adobe Illustrator, and it will also appear actual size in there. But I think I might do is actually just uh, clip this off and make a mask, and that way I can automatically create a vector in Illustrator. Okay, I'm just going to go in here and finish this up. If you ever see like uh, advertisement or clip art where it has really kind of like jagged, sharp, cut out edges, it's because people were lazy when doing this step that I'm doing right now. Uh, Photoshop does have a lot of automatic tools for this now, like Quick Select, uh, but I don't know. And let's go into Illustrator. I think I say Illustrator and Electronics because I live near Illinois. Let's see, where is this? Uh, oh, here we go, Live Image Trace. Yeah, okay. Oh, you know what I should have done instead? Actually, let me go back over here. Uh, yeah, I should make two versions of this. So I should just take this one and, uh, let's see, make a background layer, paint that, take this, duplicate the layer, and then just give it a color overlay. Like, well, probably black. There we go. Now I'll save that as a PCB mask. Got it. All right, so I'll keep this one here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to place PCB mask. Just do that. Bada boom, bada bang. Now I'm going to go to, uh, I'm just going to go for it. Done. Okay, now we see, oh, look, we got a vector out of it. Cool. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually manually put in uh, the, the screw post. So what I'll do is I'll, Grab the real PCB, like for this PlayStation button. I'll measure it. Uh, <laughs> it's exactly 0.1 inches. Another example of the uh, Imperial system. You can't stop it. If you look really closely here at this scanned circle, you can see how it stretched a little bit in that direction. See? versus that direction. And remember, that was the direction of the spherical, uh, well, not spherical lens, but that was the direction of the, you know, image compressing lens in the scanner. So yeah, that's a pretty good example of how it's more accurate in one axis than the other. I loaded up the uh, super glue gun file from the Ben Heck show. I mean, like, well, we could just take this shape right here, like here, I'll just grab the shape. Do this, blah, 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 go into one of my templates. Uh, my, my templates, which Adobe erases every other time it updates. So convenient. Uh, sarcasm warning. It's not convenient at all. I always have this thing with companies or software. Don't waste my time. I'm a very, very busy, semi-retired person. Let's grab this. Rotate it 90 degrees. Now flip it. Let's see, is that right? Yes. Okay, so that's our baseline. And then on top of that, we want to go 20 more degrees. See, there's the key. It'll fit inside of a gun handle. And actually, let's do this. Let's separate this out. And let's go 0.2. That's yeah, not quite enough. Let's go 0.185. It's pretty close. So the reason I did that, I just want to make sure I center this PCB. That's pretty good. Yeah. Of course, there's other things about this that we would change. This is just a rough test using a gun shape that I had laying around. Okay, let's export this to Fusion. So I'm going to copy this file. I'm going to make a new file, letter size. That's fine. I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it in the upper left-hand corner. So when it imports, this will be the zero, zero point. 
uh, DXF. Few versions back is usually a good idea. So 2012. All right, now Infusion. Let's get rid of this. Front view, you know, looking at the object from the side. Insert DXF. Pick that as the plane. Select File. Now it might be flipped. I'm not sure. So we'll just see what happens. Uh, yeah, it is. Oh, okay. So we just have to mirror this vertically, which is technically horizontally. Don't ask. All right. Select file. There we go. Okay. So here's the latest version of Fusion. Let's do this. Let's select the whole thing. And I think the, uh, the glue gun was just under an inch thick. This one doesn't need to be that thick. Let's go 0.85, which will also give kids a better chance of uh, playing with it. Uh, 0.85 divided by... Oh, that's too hard. Let's do 0.95. Okay, so that's 0.45 and half like that. <laughs> Hashtag laziness. Okay, so if we think about this, we want to have at least... Oh, probably at least uh, 0.1 inch wall. So it was 0.45, so we want to go 0.35. Cool, yeah. Now if we look at it on the end with a wireframe, we see that's our wall right there. Now the circuitry on the back of the unit, the thickest component is pretty thin. Actually, the thickest component is the voltage regulator. That is 0.0, what are you? 0.06. So just to be super luxurious, we're going to give this 0.1 standoff. So there's our concavity to hold the PCB. I'm going to be printing out this test handle using the Maker Gear M2 3D printer, which has my own new custom design extruder on it because I didn't like the old extruder. This one's got a big nice juicy lever on it to pinch the material just like the redesigned MakerBot Replicator 1. Here's what I like about FDM printers versus resin. When the part's done, it's, it's done. There we go. Look at that. Like a glove. It looks pretty good. So imagine like an analog stick down there. And then this would be cut away. And then your thumb would be like doing stuff there. And then you'd be moving it there. So yeah, pretty good shape. Well, I printed the uh, other half of the handle. I don't think they're going to be symmetrical like this in the end, but it's a good reference point. Yeah, I also do some lines like where our fingers go. So I'm thinking we have like a straight down portion here for your uh, triggers. And then like here we could have the, uh, the face buttons like the uh, square, circle, X, etc. We'd have the secondary analog down here. Kind of like that. If you know what I mean. Let's just get the Dremel here. Oh, this poor 3D print. It was only just learning to love. I feel like I'm a dentist. Right. So, you know, we need, we need a certain amount of handle to hold the PCB. I guess the question is, where would my thumb naturally go? Right? So you see my thumb, my thumb kind of goes to the left about, I don't know, 30 degrees. And that makes sense because that's about where they put the analog stick on a PlayStation 4 controller. Because the thing is, you can't put it up here because then you're going to be torquing your thumb back. And another thing you'd want to think about is you don't hit it with the ball of your thumb, you hit it with the tip of your thumb. So almost kind of like that might make sense. Even though it's kind of weird for the design. Let's mock it up with foam core. This uh, pad here is a little slippery. That's not super great. Oh, actually, let's do something else first. Let's, uh, yeah, we'll see where our fingers go right there. Or the 
pinky and ring and the brain. And let's do this. Let's go give us a bit of a concavity. Ah, yes. Get my fingers around that. Pew, 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 pew. I also have to take into account that uh, your index finger and middle finger are almost always different lengths. We also need to think about the fact that the thumb also is going to have to probably do the D-pad up here someplace. And the, uh, what is it? Share options, touch button, and PlayStation button. I also have to design this in a way that it can be 3D printed, obviously. Obvious statement is obvious. This isn't too bad, although it's not too great either. I think I want to angle this back even more. That's why we don't use too much hot glue. That's why you always leave a note. Half my life is just waiting for hot glue to cool off. I think it's important to uh, pick something up and kind of feel how it goes into your hand, if it feels natural. I'm thinking we could just reuse these uh, shoulder button things. Just uh, make some slits in the plastic case, slide these in and then rewire them. It's one less thing to do. Something else I've noticed, when you go to move the thumbstick, uh, your fingers tend to uh, grip down on the controller. So I, have to, I want to make sure that the buttons here actually take a decent amount of force so you don't have false triggers. Yeah, I checked with the meter. These are just 10K pots, like every other analog stick in the world. So the, yeah, the Xbox One analogs would work fine. Well, it's thinking we could put the face buttons right here where I made these red marks. What we could do is we could make the ones here a little taller and then make these a little shallower so that even when you wrap your fingers around them you can kind of feel what you're pressing. Obviously we'll have to test to make sure if it's even feasible. Also it might be cool this part right here since we kind of need it because of the circuit board anyway. What if we attached a strap around the hand? It's not too bad. It kind of reminds me of those electric uh, racetrack cars, you know, where you've got the, the trigger that you pull. And I was thinking we could maybe, I know I talked how I didn't like these, but <laughs> the D-pad thing, we could get one of these uh, tack switch guys. You can put it right, right about there. And well, it would have something on it, but then you could just go up, down, left, right when you need to. And then as far as the PlayStation button, maybe I could put those here. If there's like four of them though. It's share, option, touch, and uh, PS Home. Uh, she ain't gonna win any beauty contests, but she'll tell us what we need to know. Hey, get your businesses back on a paying basis, or you can go on welfare for the rest of the winter. Ah, uh, let's uh, just uh, attach some duct tape. Yeah. We'll just pretend this duct tape is a nice strap, even though it's duct tape. I don't use duct tape very much. I know a lot of people are like, oh yeah, duct tape, you can do anything with it, but I don't agree. I think it's a fairly noobish material. They're like, oh, but Red Green can do anything with duct tape. It's like, well, Red Green is a fictional character. Obviously, you'd have a break in it here and Velcro, but you know. So the thing that'll be nice about a strap is that, well, obviously it'll help you hold onto the controller, but it also means there's less reliance on using these fingers to uh, hold on to things, which means you'll have less false presses down here, which means you can touch these things a little bit more gingerly. This one might be a little bit too far away. So I'm going to need to move these in a little bit. But uh, yeah, thinking this is a pretty decent design. 
Now I just got to get this all into 3D on the computer. <laughs>